Hi, uh, my name is Mike Duran. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington, DC. And you are joining us for today's CAMCA Forum panel session. Uh, today's session is on the, the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, the political and economic consequences of the withdrawal. Um, we're, we have a very distinguished panel to join us today. Uh, before I turn to my speakers, let me just say a few words about uh, the, these CAMCA sessions in case you may not be familiar with them. Uh, this is the CAMCA Regional Forum. CAMCA stands for Central Asia, Mongolia, Caucasus, and Afghanistan. Uh, this is organized by the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, the Rumsfeld Foundation, and the CAMCA Network, um, which is a premier convener of rising leaders from the 10 countries of the CAMCA region. And it serves as a platform for region-wide discussions and a means of advancing economic growth and social development across Central Asia and the Caucasus. Uh, it's also a means of uh, drawing attention to Americans, I think, and, 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 and others um, who have not been following or not been aware of um, the exciting developments that are taking place in this region. Uh, uh, and I would say I am one of those people who has been awakened to uh, the importance of the Central Asia, uh, the Caucasus, Mongolia, and Afghanistan, thanks to the CAMCA network. Uh, I'm a, a, a Middle East specialist by, uh, by training. Um, recently took a trip uh, facilitated by the Rumsfeld Foundation to, uh, to Central Asia, and I'm very excited to uh, serve as the moderator today on this, uh, uh, on this session. Uh, to start things off, to talk about the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have with us Dr. Uh, Omar Sharifi. Uh, he's an assistant professor at the American University of Afghanistan, uh, the senior research fellow and Kabul director of the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies. Um, and he is also uh, a CAMCA network member. So without further ado, uh, I'll uh, pass it over to you, Dr. Sharifi, to get us uh, started in understanding these, uh, these uh, very momentous developments. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in this panel and specifically talking about Afghanistan in the time that um, all the world in a way focused most on the withdrawal of the, of the United States and the international forces from Afghanistan. And at the same time, what are the consequences of it for the wider region and specifically for the future of Afghanistan and, and more importantly, the future of the whole idea of all these terrorist networks that were kind of was the first, the reason that why the United States actually came first to the region. So um, what we are facing today in Afghanistan is a major, like that whole, um, the opinion here is that the whole idea of like the peace deal with the Taliban that was done under the President Trump and then sort of like reaffirmed by President Biden, somehow um, the whole process, the way it was sort of structured, it was kind of uh, done, created a lot of problems. And in problems in the sense of that, um, it showed, I mean, in a way, it for the first time it provided legitimacy for the groups who were actually were close court cooperators of all supporters of Al-Qaeda in the beginning. And at the same time, it, and it in a way gave, provided the, I mean, the idea was that by, by recognizing the Taliban, um, it will somehow will, um, in a way, further the cause of the peace in Afghanistan. But what we're facing today is the whole idea of the withdrawal is happening in a way that is not based on the realities on the ground. It, it, with the decision was kind of made in haste, and um, this withdrawal of the United States somehow created a vacuum in Afghanistan, which the Taliban and their supporting networks, such as Al Qaeda, Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, uh, the Pakistani, other Pakistani based uh, groups actually taking most advantage and, in a way, spreading around the country. Now, what does it mean in long term? And what does it mean, in a way, uh, in a, in, for the security of the region and for the prosperity of the region, and more importantly, for the stability of Afghanistan in long term? There's a the withdrawal of the United States somehow, as I mentioned before, created a security vacuum. Security vacuum in the sense of the United States, not in terms of military, it's military participant, but in terms of providing logistical support for the Afghan forces. It, by withdrawing their uh, forces from Afghanistan and all the network that kind of sustained and helped to uh, provide necessary support for the Afghan army, it in a way forced a lot of the Afghan troops and uh, to withdraw from the, a lot of places in a way created Led the and where the Taliban now taking kind of taking over. 
At the same time, there is a lot of fear that Afghanistan will sort of go back to the 1990s and become a safe haven for the Taliban and the other kind of like extremist groups that were active before. But how much it's based on reality. Today, um, what we're facing Afghanistan, despite the international withdrawal, what is hope, uh, what we're facing today in Afghanistan is not like the same like 1990s. Yes, the Taliban is as major threat as it used to be in the 1990s, but at the same time, Afghanistan as a country transformed. 20 years of international presence created an infrastructure that never existed in the course of history in the country. Not just in terms of sort of physical infrastructure, like from the universities to roads, to communication, to media, to everything else, but in terms of human capital and connectivity with the world. Um, today, um, Afghanistan, despite enormous threats by the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS and the other Pakistani-based groups somehow still is an absolutely different country than it used to be in the 1996 when the Taliban emerged and took over Kabul. But the question is, will it sustain, will it survive the answer of the Taliban? Will it actually manage to hold on despite with the withdrawal of international community from this country? Now, what in my like understanding, like I'm trying to contextualize, understanding Afghanistan, not as just as what is happening today, but in a, putting it in the context of what history. In the 1990s, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda managed to take over the country because Afghanistan was completely cut off from the rest of the world. That was the only time in the course of history that Afghan, in a way that uh, Afghanistan was completely cut off from the world and that that created a vacuum in which those extremist groups, specifically with the support of the Pakistani government, managed to fill and, but, but, um, and, and kind of took over most of the country. At the same time, uh, what, we, what we're seeing today, um, uh, the Taliban, despite their like sort of now, they're spreading across the country and taking a lot of districts, there is absolutely no plan for them to how to govern the country. There is absolutely no plan. Um, and that makes it actually very sort of keep, uh, there is this question, will they be able to sustain this momentum? Will they be able to actually provide what the people now get used to for the 20 years? For 20 years, I've honestly went through like a massive social sort of uh, um, change in which now we have so much to expect from, uh, to, to actually so much to lose. While in 1996, that was not the case, 1999, not the case. So what will that mean for the entire region? I think nobody, I mean, the experience of the 1990s and the regional rivalry showed that no regional country alone by itself has the kind of um, economic kind of power nor a kind of administrative ability to somehow manage the crisis and control all these uh, different groups that is now kind of operating under the Taliban and trying to present uh, sort of, so an absolute, it's absolute necessity for Afghanistan survival and actually for the prosperity of the region. The Afghanistan and the Afghan government remain connected with the world. Now, exactly what does it mean uh, for, for like um, today, both Afghan government and the Taliban, thanks to some efforts by the region, are now engaged in some sort of talks. These talks are still very much subject to the realities on the ground, but at the same time, there is, for the first time, there is an effort going on in terms of like kind of creating a set, establishing a settlement between the between the Taliban movement and the government. How much this this kind of this what they called out today as a peace process is actually a realistic kind of how much it gives us a realistic perspective about the possibility of the peace in the region. Again, any meaningful settlement in the region cannot be achieved if the world, and specifically the United States, will actually withdraw and completely kind of wash their hands from the region. That technically means that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and the other groups will, will fill the vacuum. It doesn't mean that the resistance against them will cease. It will continue, as just we're seeing today and these days in many parts of the country, which the people reject by like local uprisings and stuff. Um, but at the same time, it's a test. I think uh, the whole peace process, not just simply about ensuring the peace for Afghanistan, was actually ensuring this security for the region and for the world to kind of show that the world will not be subjected to kind of a horrific events of 9-11 again. And that can also be achieved with the direct and meaningful engagement of the world to actually uh, ensure the transition of Taliban from a militant group into a political reality, into a political group. So we are sort of in a very sort of a threshold of our history, of the engagement with the international community, 
And there is a lot of fear that the world will simply just say, it's not going to work, we're going to leave and leave it to the region. And we know that the region itself is in a situation in which kind of, as I kind of explain this, like kind of a strategic ambiguity. What, but actually what ensure this kind of a peaceful transition into peace and a meaningful transition into sustainability of the region and actually to deny the place, the space to be used again by these kind of hard minor groups, extremist groups such as Al-Qaeda or Lashkar Tayyibah and all the other groups, is that the United States and the world continue to be engaged meaningfully, both diplomatically, financially, and if necessary, logistically with the Afghan government. Because history shows that no Afghan government ever fell to a insurgency as long as it had international support. And I think an international presence and international engagement and a regional engagement with this whole Afghanistan actually also ensure that Afghanistan will never become another base for Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, for Al-Qaeda kind of groups and Taliban, and which will actually enable the Taliban themselves to transform into something of a political group or just a militant kind of an organization. So we are now in a threshold of a very important kind of moment in our history and a meaningful engagement with the world actually, I believe personally, will ensure a stability in the region. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much for those, uh, for those uh, very insightful opening remarks. Um, we're gonna move on now uh, to our next speaker, but before we do, I just wanna say, I would like to come back to you, um, Dr. Sharifi, um, later in the discussion and, and talk about some of the specific ways the, the United States might remain um, engaged. What, what exactly does engagement mean in this, uh, in this new era? But before we get to that, let's turn now uh, to, uh, to uh, Ikram Segal. He is the chairman of the Pathfinder Group and the chairman of the Karachi Council on Foreign Relations. Um, his bio also tells us, I can't resist saying this, that he is the uh, first Pakistani prisoner of war to have escaped from India. I'm dying to ask him about that, but it has nothing to do with our panel today, so that will have to wait to a, till another time. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Segal, um, we just heard this very interesting description of Afghanistan now as more connected, more linked to the world than, than ever before. Um, that connectivity also includes um, serving as a crossroads uh, between, um, between different countries of Central Asia and the, and the outside world, in, including Pakistan. Can that connectivity and those economic interests, can they, will they be enough um, to help the region and, and the world stabilize Afghanistan after the pullout of the United States? Thank you. Um... You know, I was listening very closely to what Mr. Shriva was saying. And I think uh, it is important first to give an overview of the whole region to understand uh, the, the economic and political ramifications that are there. First of all, uh, let us look at Pakistan. And Pakistan is a geopolitical bridge, uh, which is not only part of South Asia, a part of Central Asia, but a part of the Middle East. Uh, now, that with the advent of the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a part of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and which uh, incidentally is, uh, the road is through, the railway lines, of course, are not through. But if you look at the connectivity of the region, you have to go back to uh, the Baghdad Pact and its successor, Central, Central Treaty Organization, which uh, formed an economic uh, thing called the Regional Cooperation for Development. And people do not realize that during the Regional Cooperation for Development, a lot of uh, the communication facilities in both Iran and Turkey uh, were built up and uh, a little bit in Pakistan. There's a high, highway, in fact, stretched from Karachi right up to Istanbul, which is called the RCD Highway, which is in a very dilapidated state in between. But over the years, uh, this highway has uh, been improved and the connectivity is there. Uh, with today it just needs a little upgrading. Um, now I'm going to back to a little personal experience, which uh, you know Michael has referred to, but probably you do not know. Then when the Karakoram Highway was being made, uh, and this was in the uh, 60s, uh, in, the, in the late 60s, the current highway was a highway connecting uh, Xinjiang province uh, to Pakistan. 
at that point of time, uh, this was the highest road in the world. And uh, I had the pleasure and the privilege of working uh, as a pilot, an army aviation pilot, attached to the People's Liberation Army, two divisions which are making the mountain highway. So for a period of six months, uh, you know, I was there and I saw the tremendous effort that was put in to cross the Karakram Mountains. And, and if you really once, if you, any of you are, can ever visit that, you can see what a stupendous task it was. Um, during that time, um, I had the good fortune of having an interpreter which was fresh on the job from Beijing University, the, the language college in Beijing University. His name was Chang Chung Liang Ziang. And Chang Chung Ziang, uh, uh, you know, uh, and I were the thing, etc. We used to have a number of casualties because they had the old way of blowing up rocks, you know, drilling holes, gunpowder, etc. And, uh, you know, one day I asked him, I said, uh, you know, Ch you Chang must be very stupid. Why are you killing yourself for this work? You know, and he looked at me for some time. He was also tired. And, you know, because there were a lot of casualties that day. And he said, uh, no, um, you Pakistanis are stupid. You know, because you people think in terms of five, 10 years, we think in terms of 50, 100 years. You know, one day we'll be down to Karachi. You know, well, Gwaza didn't exist at that time. And Mr. Chang, that was 1970. And Mr. Chang eventually, um, in fact, he was a consul general in Houston also at one time all the things but he went and became in 2003 became the ambassador of, of China to Pakistan you know and um, he, every year or second year he rings me up and says who's stupid you know so, <laughs> the point is what I'm trying to make is the China Pakistan economic corridor is only one facet of the BRI the other facet people do not realize and which is very important for Afghanistan very important for Afghanistan is the North-South Corridor. The mm -hmm. corridor which comes from Euro Europe into Asia, Central Asia, and then down to Gwadar and to Shabah. Now, this is very important. And this is going to happen because the connectivity is there. Now, you, there is no military solution uh, to Afghanistan. And there can never be. 20 years of it, we've seen it cannot be. It, the solution has to be economic. The solution has to be political. I think, uh, you know, First of all, let's see in the future. You know, Mr. Sharifi has said about, you know, uh, people, uh, the Afghan army regrouping. Well, really, something smaller on a very smaller scale is going to happen what happened to the Afghan army after the Soviets left. You know, most of them were defect to the Taliban, right? Except in uh, the, of course, the Tajik areas and the Uzbek areas and the Hazar areas. But the Pashtun areas, most of them were defect you know, said, and this area will be that one. I think uh, my own feeling is that the Taliban have matured to a degree to understand that this cannot go on. This war, war is not a solution. So I think they will compromise to an extent. They will compromise. Now, who are the people who are interested? The people who are interested, uh, who are the people who are interested in peace? All the immediate neighbors of Afghanistan uh, are interested in peace. It's Pakistan. Iran, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, China, whoever is interested in peace. People who are not interested in peace are, do, not, do not have borders with, uh, uh, with Afghanistan. And they have got their own agendas, you know, people fighting a proxy war, people fighting whatever. I don't want to go into that. But the point is that you've got the thing. And why economic? Can I tell you why? You know, I, I was a director of Bank al Falam. I used to see, uh, you know, uh, so many millions of tons of wheat made into flour and then going across in trucks to Afghanistan. Afghanis, you know, the Pakistanis use a coarse form of flour from wheat. And the Afghanis eat a very fine uh, net of So they were especially these milling factories, uh, flour milling factories, which should do that. So all these were in a, in a belt in Pakistan, just go away. Now, if that uh, million, uh, so many million tons of wheat made into flour doesn't go into Afghanistan, we would never need and our prices of uh, flour would be very low. Our prices of wheat, because Pakistan basically is a you know, country which can feed and clothe itself with cotton and rice and wheat, etc. So what is there in Afghanistan? I'll tell you what is there in Afghanistan. If you go back to history, throughout history, Afghans used to live of the people that used to pass through Afghanistan. Right? They used to do in a crude way at that time. They used to 
but go and you know hold up the caravan and take part of the thing and said okay fine go ahead right well you can do that in an, because if you look at it if, it, if the roads and railways are coming through central asia the gas pipelines are coming to central asia it has to pass through afghanistan if it passes through afghanistan there is a transit fee stored and as uh, mr sharifi has said you know the infrastructure has developed right so i think it is in the interest of us you know we as pakistan look we are not comfortable we are not comfortable with a vacuum in afghanistan because is eventually this is going to come and haunt us also some day in the future when somebody decides that okay now let's look at our neighbors and what we can do because our army has fought a very long war to eradicate terrorism within the country this is the only place uh, uh, i think place in the world where both counter insurgency has succeeded in fata and swat and counter terrorism has uh, succeeded in fata and swat and even in the cities uh, the amount of terrorism has been cut down drastically it's not that there uh, because i run the largest private security company in in the country and i guard a lot of foreigners i know that there is terrorism but you know the the amount of attacks normal attacks against whatever has gone down drastically you have you know maybe one and two incidents in a year not the amount of type of incidents that take place i think if you look at it connectivity that connectivity is going to help afghanistan i think at the end of the day Afghanistan. I, I think if I, if I look at it, if I if I were to point out to one person, which I thought were the things like people like Abdullah Abdullah, the pragmatists, right? They are pragmatists, and I think the Pashtun elements are, are ready to talk to him, even though there were uh, you know a, a lot of uh, discord between them because of the previous history uh, and you know uh, the Ahmed Shah Massoud uh, group and all that. But now I think they are more pragmatic. They are talking to them. i think but you look at it you know who are people going to lose out the people are going to lose out who really robbed of pakistan i'm sorry they are ones you go to dubai you know the biggest uh, owners of villas in 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 dubai are the ones where the money comes from the money was siphoned off all the aid that was given to them right and so they are the ones who benefited the most and they are the ones who will not really lose they just change uh, countries right if they have not not already done so and where are the refugees going to go we already got 3 million refugees still existing with us and we'll get another influx this happens all the time first when the soviets invaded we had refugees when the uh, when Ta- Ta- taliban took over we had refugees so the, we are the largest uh, uh, you know uh, harboring the last amount of refugees from anywhere the, the iranians never let them more than 5 miles of the border in our case Our refugees went all over the country. In, in Islamabad, if you go to Islamabad, 15% of the real estate in Islamabad are Afghan-owned, right? Some mm-hmm. of these Afghan leaders uh, have uh, wives in Quetta and uh, and in uh, in Islamabad. So, and it's a fact of life. So, I think if you will look at it from the from the political and the economic point of view, you know, I think that pragmatism is the name of the game. people have to approach the the thing people cannot just turn around and say you know why why but this this is not the same taliban that were there 20 years ago they are they are not the same taliban they they are different they are a different group they are more pragmatic right the, the, you know we talk about people talk about uh, the, you know who's leading the afghan talks the person who leading the afghan talks you know actually the behind the scenes is a chap called stanik zai stanik zai was an uh, afghan army officer who defected to the and fought and fought with uh, with a uh, with a group a mujahideen group with the american uh, support for many years for eight years he fought right and he went of course when the time came of course he went over to the taliban at, at that point of time but he is the person who really calling that these people are pragmatists and they are going to see that they want this country to succeed i think i'm you know first of all i don't see the central government the present central government such lasting right i wish i should going to take a flight soon out of the country right there's a fact of life right you cannot avoid it we don't want to stay around right he you know the other people who were in the country who stayed around the country and fought in the country will right they've got roots in the country they, they will stay there and i think we have to be pragmatic about it and we have to be realistic about it and one of the things is that we have to make sure 
that the Afghan themselves have a solution which they should themselves uh, uh, form. The Afghans do not like to be dictated by anybody, whether and it may be Pakistanis or anybody, right? It can. They have to be. They have to make whatever solution is talk to themselves and make the solutions. I think if you look at it, if you look at it, and if you you know if you go on to you think I I say this with some experience. I was a director of until it, uh, broke up East West Institute for about 15 years, right? And uh, John Ross, uh, actually, I'm sure Michael knows John Ross. You know, um, John Ross tasked me with this uh, uh, thing called Afghanistan Reconnected. So for about eight years, I left that, I led the dialogue between Pakistanis and Afghans and Iranians, et cetera, who's back, you know, which we're talking about economic and uh, mostly economic uh, consequences. And I got a fair sense of, uh, what was happening at that time. And I got a lot of people that understood what was happening. And I think if you go through that process for eight years and you understand, uh, you know, this thing, et cetera, you ultimately you come to one solution and one solution alone. And that is the thing is economic. And through econ yeah. economy, you'll have political solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a very interesting thesis. Uh, certainly there are... Um, enormous economic interests that are all aligning in the direction of stability in Afghanistan. Uh, you've got the North-South Corridor from Uzbekistan to Gwadar, and you've got the East-West all the way from Pakistan to, uh, um, to Turkey. The question is, uh, are the interests of the spoilers going to overwhelm the, uh, overwhelm the interests of the, of the pragmatists? Um, and with that thought in mind, Let's move to our next speaker, uh, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyaya. He's a senior visiting fellow uh, at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. Um, he was the ambassador of India to Afghanistan from, uh, from 2010 to 2013. Uh, he's also been ambassador to Myanmar and Syria. So uh, we're speaking with somebody who has enormous experience on the world stage in incredibly difficult places uh, and who knows Afghanistan uh, like the back of his hand, I assume. So uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyaya, uh, I'd love to get your reactions to these, uh, this growing thesis we have here that uh, economic interests and pragmatism are gonna win the day. What's your answer to that question? Uh, thank you. Uh, good day, good day to everyone. Uh, morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, let me also just actually add to my bio a little there by saying that, you know, I traveled through Afghanistan as a student uh, before the, the Soviet intervention uh, that was in 1977. So I've seen a bit of Afghanistan and it was really part of the crossroads between the East and the West. And then subsequently I reopened the Embassy of India in, in Kabul uh, at the fall of the Taliban, that is November 2001. And I uh, finally came back as ambassador between 2010 and 13. So I have kind of snatches or glimpses of Afghanistan, shorter or longer, over a considerable period of time. And in the earliest stage in 1977, I traveled by road. Uh, so let me, um, first of all, start off by thanking uh, the Central Asian Caucasian Institute for inviting me to this event uh, and also to its partner institutions. Uh, and of course, I welcome this uh, opportunity to dialogue with a part of the world with whom we have very strong historical ties as well as contemporary political ties. Um, I had resolved that, you know, I'm not going to make this into an India-Pakistan issue, uh, but I just I must dismiss a couple of pot shots that were made by Mr. Seger uh, about countries that want peace uh, and countries that don't want peace not sharing a border. Uh, of course, I should remind him that uh, uh, you know, the Karakoram Highway that he talked about goes through a part of, uh, of uh, what was inherited by India at the, uh, during partition. And also that India has contributed, uh, pledged uh, 3 billion in aid and has no history of interference in Afghanistan, no history of terrorism either. And the Indian embassy has been attacked, not by terrorism uh, bred from India. So, uh, you know, I want to begin with a very interesting observation in the ECAMCA brief for this panel discussion, which begins like this. If America continues to see Afghanistan as a standalone issue, unattached to the fate of Central and South Asia, its strategic engagement with the region as a whole may lose its geopolitical foundation. And I'd actually like to begin by saying that in fact, 
the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan has not been strategic. Uh, Self-professedly, it was there to, uh, to respond to a terrorist attack. Uh, in fact, it has not really taken advantage of its presence in Afghanistan to spread its uh, uh, influence strategically in the region. It has been a net security provider for virtually every other country in the region, including India, but particularly Central Asia, including Russia, even Iran, and also China. Uh, and uh, in fact, it has actually really gained nothing, strategic, nothing strategically in the course of its 20-year in intervention. Uh, and therefore, when it is actually leaving, uh, the question of it uh, preserving its strategic independence or adding to it, in fact, doesn't come in. In fact, it just stands to lose. Uh, now, uh, starting with that, uh, I'd like to say that notwithstanding that, the fact is that the U.S. has been the linchpin uh, of the security architecture of the region during this period. And its departure is going to create an enormous uh, vacuum. Uh, that will uh, really be filled by its rivals and its uh, enemies. Uh, foremost among them, of course, will be internally will be the Taliban. The Taliban will uh, certainly advance. It might not succeed. I don't think it will entirely, uh, but it certainly will advance. Uh, the immediate gainers of this will be Pakistan. And I can see a sense of triumphalism in Pakistan that perhaps they are back to uh, the 96-2001 days when they will have tutelage over Afghanistan. Uh, China uh, will definitely be a beneficiary because of uh, any space that is being vacated by the United States and the current competition between the United States and China will be occupied uh, uh, by China. Uh, Russia will be perhaps uh, satisfied in the short run, but already there is a disagreement on the whole notion of the emirate with the Taliban. And very likely, it might have to change its position. Iran has benefited to some extent and, of course, would like to see uh, the U.S. back out. Uh, but clearly, it will also be at odds with the Taliban once sectarian, sectarian and other cultural issues uh, predominate. Uh, but let me say that while the Taliban appears to be taking over uh, quite boldly right now, uh, it is something to be expected. You know, the Afghan National Defense Forces have never really, really been trained or they've never been prepared, uh, even through the NATO uh, training assignment, for a really defensive war to actually hold territory. In fact, their emphasis has been on the counter-offensive, on special forces, in being able to retake places uh, that are strategically important to them back. So it's very likely that what we are seeing right now is a kind of repositioning, uh, surrender territory uh, in favor of population centers. But having said that, I would still say that we are at a moment of vulnerability in Afghanistan because of a number of factors, primary amongst them, the withdrawal of uh, uh, US air support and possibly a lot of technical support that might come. Uh, Taliban control of a lot of strategic points, its effort to, to, uh, to isolate the cities and over a period of time been a kind of war of attrition. Uh, but having said that, you know, this is a new Afghanistan, as Omar Sharifi said, and this is a new Afghanistan, Afghan army. Uh, there will be a lot of resistance. Uh, unlike in the 1990s, uh, uh, the Afghan National Army will be supported by a great part of its population. The entire urban demography, the new Afghanistan that has come into being post-2001 will be behind the Republican order. Uh, in 1996, when the Taliban came, they came after a period of incredible instability and internecine conflict in Afghanistan, and they were seen as a kind of pious religious force that were going to bring in stability. That is no longer the case. Now they are seen as a terrorist force spread outside and supported uh, uh, by, by, by Pakistan. Uh, in the countryside, a lot of people will tolerate them, but even in the countryside, uh, the, the Afghan population now strongly yearns for education, including for their girls, and there will be a very strong culture clash uh, on that point. Now, there will not be an immediate resolution. Perhaps the stalemate may continue for a year. At the end of that year, uh, maybe there is some reason for the, Afghan, uh, the Taliban to compromise. At this moment, they are looking for a military takeover. And I disagree with Mr. Segal that there is a fundamental change in their outlook. Uh, their mindset remains the same. They simply have not grasped that there is a new, entirely new generation that has come back over the 20 years and, uh, and, uh, and that there will be resistance, resistance to them. Resistance will come from various quarters. Um, I'm running a little out of time, so let me just touch on, I think, what are the most important geopolitical aspects right now. Mm -hmm. I think 
what is going to happen at this is for the time being, uh, you know, during this period of the last 20 years, more or less the beneficiaries, the strategic and political beneficiaries of post born Republic of Afghanistan were the new generation of Afghanistan, were countries like the United States, Europe, and India. Uh, with the US withdrawal, in fact, the strategic balance is going to shift towards China, Russia, uh, Iran, and Pakistan. The losers will be the new Afghanistan, Europe, United States, and India. Uh, but as I said, this is not uh, 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 you know, a, a contest that is just simply going to end like that. Uh, Mr. Seger spoke a lot about geoeconomics. I think if we look at it right now, what we are likely to see is that uh, Pakistan and China will ride pity back, back, back for each other. Pakistan will be China's ears and eyes in Afghanistan. Uh, China will be Pakistan's economic horse. Uh, ostensibly to bring in some economic growth and development and prosperity to uh, Afghanistan. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, you know, but China will be wary about its investments unless it can have that stability and security as well. But more importantly, um, uh, that, you know, uh, so uh, what we are seeing in the immediate phase is a kind of much larger competition between the United States and China centered on the Indo-Pacific. And what I see China in its kind of probing moves in Ladakh and Tajikistan and now the, through the Karakorams, trying to probe through the Pamils and the Hindu Kush and Afghanistan through diplomacy, COVID and many other ways in order to make a kind of strategic, uh, call it a breakthrough uh, to Iran and the Gulf. In other words, China's response to pressure in the Indo-Pacific is going to be to reach across uh, the most formidable Pamils uh, into Central Asia, Afghanistan, and tie up with Afghanistan. This is the geopolitical contest that we have. And it's very interesting and strange that in a way that uh, uh, Afghanistan, which is the center of rivalry of the United States, two biggest rivals in the world right now, China and Russia, Afghanistan is right there in the weakest underbelly of China and that the United States should be ceding such space in this area right now. It is quite possible that in due course, the China, uh, United States will discover that Afghanistan and Central Asia is very much part of the uh, US-China great game and might uh, return to uh, take some interest there. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I agree with uh, Omar Sharifi uh, that uh, Pakistan will, uh, Afghanistan will go to a, a period of great instability uh, and uncertainty, uh, most likely conflict. And I think there are people in Afghanistan, including General Bhatma himself, who are a little concerned about the possible blowback on this uh, on Afghanistan. So uh, uh, Pakistan may wish to ride this geo economic strategy, but I'm not sure Pakistan has the capability of doing so given the condition of its own economy in its current state. It might try to ride piggyback on, uh, uh, on China, but Pakistan itself has a lot to worry about from a security point of view in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I want to uh, break with the precedent I've set and ask you a quick uh, follow-up question um, because you have presented um, a very uh, interesting and nuanced counter thesis to uh, what we heard prior. Uh, and uh, uh, and I, I want to just explore it a little bit for the purpose of the larger discussion. Um, you have you have presented one of continuing conflict and also you, of the winners and the losers, which you presented very, very clearly. At the same time, however, you conceded a little bit, uh, I would say, um, and I'd, I'd ask for your response, uh, to Mr. Segal's uh, argument um, that there are, and to a certain extent, Mr., uh, Dr. Sharifi's argument, that there are very significant economic interests at play here that, are, that militate in, or th at least support um, political stability. And so my question for you would be, is it possible that the Chinese in their alliance with the, uh, with the Pakistanis and in their push to the Persian Gulf um, through, uh, um, through uh, Pakistan and, and, uh, and Afghanistan might be interested in throwing their weight behind stability and, and in an effort to at least find a, a pragmatic political accommodation with the Taliban? Okay, let me uh, respond to that. One question is that, look, this China-Pakistan collaboration can be positive if China acts as a leash on, on Pakistan and Afghanistan. 
uh, that is uh, one uh, uh, possibility. Uh, the second is that, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the possibility that in fact, China may use its economic weight to actually empower uh, Pakistan in Afghanistan. In that case, of course, it will not be welcome in, in Afghanistan. Uh, when you look at Afghanistan, you know, the center of gravity of trade historically has not been any other part of the world except the large market of India. In fact, the market of India of 2000 years, uh, there has been trade and cultural intercourse between uh, North India and uh, Afghanistan and beyond that to Central Asia. And those are links that we uh, treasure and we would very much like to see again. The future of Afghanistan is closely and intimately tied uh, with trade with India. Uh, and this is the thing that has been prevented by Pakistan all this while, and that China will not be able to replace. Uh, because this simply, the, the logic of geography is uh, not in that favor. Uh, India's history goes back 2000 years, more than that with Afghanistan. Pakistan is a new creation, maybe uh, 75 years, you know, uh, reaching, getting to that point. Uh, so, you know, there are currents of history that not, simply cannot be reversed. And uh, what we are seeing right now is an aberration. Uh, let me go back. Even as late as 1977, when I traveled through India, uh, through Afghanistan, India used to have a military technical training team in Kabul. And this was not a political issue, even between India and uh, Pakistan. Uh, in fact, since the Soviet intervention, Pakistan has simply tried to revise history into making people feel that India does not belong in Afghanistan, that Pakistan does. Pakistan has a natural right to Afghanistan in some ways, and India is a kind of interloper in uh, alien. That's simply not the case. You talk to any Afghan, and we know, we are very sure how we are perceived in Afghanistan. We are perceived as a peaceful and positive force, and one that has contributed these 20 years. You know, Omar said something very interesting, which I'd like to pick up. This 20 years was a period of relative stability in Afghanistan's history post Rahir Shah. There has never been a 20 year period like this. This has been a period in which refugees have not left Afghanistan. In fact, expatriates have come back. Uh, that situation may change once again with the return of uh, the Taliban. And once again, the cycle will play out. Maybe the Taliban and Pakistan will come up for five years, but there will be a 20-year rebound after that as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, we will move on uh, to uh, Alex Vertanka. Uh, he is the director of the Iran program um, and a senior fellow at the Frontier Europe Initiative at the Middle East uh, at the Middle East Institute here in Washington. And uh, before we went on air, um, Alex also told us that uh, he uh, was born in Iran, but then his parents FedExed him, these are his words, to, to, Den to Denmark. So we have before us a representative, a product of the modern Silk Road with all its connectivity. Alex, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be on the panel with my fellow panelists. I really enjoyed the conversation so far. And I do want to be brief because I want to leave as much time for the debate. That's the part I really look forward to the most. So I've I'll written a couple of or a few bullet points down. I'll try and do it in five minutes so we can get to the last speaker and hopefully the Q&A. Uh, I wanted to start off with a few basic reminders in terms of the history of Iran's policies in Afghanistan. What the drivers have been in recent years and presently, and perhaps say a few words about uh, what to expect going forward. Uh, look, um, I'm not going to surprise anyone when I say Afghanistan, from Tehran's perspective, has been a staging ground, uh, or a potential staging ground, I should say, uh, that needed a, a very careful uh, handling. That was true for the Shah who feared the Soviets would use Afghanistan as a base to get to him uh, in the 60s, in the 70s. That was arguably the, the only really calculation the Shah had for being involved in Afghanistan. And in the last 20 or so years, the United States presence in Afghanistan has uh, made the Islamic Republic, the ruling elite in Tehran, wonder what uh, intrigue the Americans might get up to uh, in terms of using Afghanistan as a base to get to the Islamic Republic. I think these are important to remember. Uh, the, the Arguably, what I'm trying to say here has been on a defensive side, if you will, 
Now, we can disagree with, with the uh, articulation that Iran's policy towards Afghanistan has been a defensive one, because a lot of people will say it's been a meddling one and not necessarily a good uh, meddling force. But certainly from Tehran's perspective, it's seen as a potential area where instability might come from and therefore you prevent it. And that has been, you know, uh, the driving force. Um, Tehran, again, without, it goes without saying, considered uh, or considers itself as a natural power broker in Kabul. And you try and tell them otherwise. Um, we heard the Indian perspective, the Pakistani perspective and so forth. The Iranians feel they have a natural role to play in Afghanistan and that they are legitimate. And I don't think that they're, they're kind of almost set in stone. I don't expect, um, I don't expect any changes on that front. I wanted to read something that I wrote two years ago, Mike, in a paper I did for the Atlantic Council, uh, which was titled The Bottom Line of Iran's Interest in, in Afghanistan. And I wrote in, in that paper somewhere on those pages that but, buttressing the Western Afghan provinces on the water, border with Iran to create an indisputable zone of influence and absorbing Afghanistan into the Iranian sphere of economic power through the pan-regional initiatives such as the Iran-Afghanistan in the agreement in order to use the Chabahar port as a conduit for trade among Iran, India, Afghanistan, and the landlocked Central Asian countries. So that's just one example of the type of key driving forces. I mean, this is the economic one. And I think that is still relevant to this state, but I just want to put the economic side, since we talked about that this morning, the economic calculations, to my mind, clearly come secondary, obviously, to much more uh, security uh, calculations that have shaped Iranian policies in Afghanistan. So I would say, uh, you know, uh, right now, when I look at the Iranian debate in terms of what's going on in Afghanistan, it seems to me the one worry they have is, will there be another all-out civil war in that country, like in the 1990s. Now, what you've heard from uh, speakers before, uh, it seems to me at least some are suggesting that's not going to happen because Afghanistan has moved on. And that might very well be true, but I think the Iranians aren't there yet in that assessment. So they are perhaps thinking in terms of the zero-sum game competition that did happen in the 1990s. The big question is, how would it be looking different this time around as, as opposed to what happened 20-some years ago? The one big change that has happened here, uh, I think, and this is a recent phenomenon. In the 1990s, what you had was Iran, Russia, and India kind of siding in, in one camp against the Gulf-backed Pakistani initiative in terms of supporting the Taliban. And, you know, I hope I'm not being controversial in saying that. Um, the question is, can that be replic replicated? And arguably, that will not, because the region right now is in a different place. We have right now the Iranians trying to at least talk to the Gulf Arab states in about the future of Yemen, potentially about the future of uh, Iraq and Syria, which tells us that there is a sense uh, that all the states are kind of maybe uh, have overreached. They want to recalibrate. They want to think about their options differently going forward, which might be the good news out of this, which might be that you know, countries like Iran are willing to sit down and compromise. I think it was today that Prime Minister Imran Khan of Pakistan, I read in the news, talked about you know, what we did in the 1990s, thinking that the one Afghan faction can win it all for us. That was a mistake, that we should uh, encourage a dialogue among Afghan factions. If that is the Pakistani position, and if the Iranians agree, which I suspect at least a good part of the Iranian state would see it that way, then again, that to me is a hopeful sign that you're not going to repeat the zero-sum game of the 1990s, that you're going to reach for basic minimum accommodation for the sake of you know, preventing all-out war in, in Afghanistan. Iran will be a major um, you know, tar target is not the right word, but it would certainly uh, pay a price should there be another civil war in Afghanistan the way it was the case in the 1990s. Look, uh, I don't know the number, nobody knows the numbers, Two million plus uh, Afghan refugees still in Iran. The country's population has grown. 
If you got more instability in Afghanistan, that will hit Iran, no doubt about it. And it would hit Iran at a time where Iran is very weak itself. I mean, Afghan civil war in the future could have far more uh, direct uh, implications for Iranian security in Iran than we've seen in the past. Where in the past it was just a refugee problem, it could be different going forward. Um, I would just maybe uh, sort of end up by saying the following because as I said, I, I wanted to go to the Q&A. The irony is that you have right now a new Iranian uh, president. The Iranian president, as we know, does not decide strategic decisions, but um, Ibrahim Raisi now and the people that are running Tehran have a, a choice here. Do they want to genuinely pursue deeper ties with China all the way out, the way that the 25 year strategic agreement that was signed in March suggests they would? Well, then, they're in danger of becoming China's foot soldiers in Afghanistan, kind of like Iran became foot soldiers of Russia in Syria. That's not an Iranian interest. I don't think that's an Iranian interest. Love to get into that uh, in more detail, but I just want to uh, suggest to you that there is a group of people in Tehran for ideological reasons, because of their position in the United States, have forgotten the fact that the last 20 years where Iran has actually done quite well in Afghanistan, Stability in Afghanistan, relative stability in Afghanistan, has been good news for Iran. To give you another way of looking at it, today Afghanistan, I believe, uh, is, well, Iran is Afghanistan's largest trading partner, right? These are all good news and could not have happened without the United States having been on the ground in Afghanistan. But there's a faction in Tehran that doesn't perhaps want to see it that way and wants to gamble. And it would be a big gamble. Go in and say, you know, let's undermine the Americans. Let's get them out of here as fast as we can. Let's partner up with whoever wants to partner up with us to get them out of here and then hope for the best. I think that would be a mistake on the part of Iran if they go there. Uh, but as I said, unfortunately, there is a group that now uh, is uh, rising uh, in Tehran that looks at the region, including Afghanistan, as part of that um, geopolitical race that they have with the United States. Um, and as I said, again, just to repeat it, that is a, a mistake on the part of the, uh, uh, those Iranians in Tehran who think that way. Uh, if they balance their foreign policy, if they accepted the fact that, you know, uh, having a dialogue with countries like Pakistan and Gulf states and Russia and China is good for the future of Afghanistan, but why not add the United States to the list? And why not try and preserve as much as possible of what has been achieved for, for the last 20 years in Afghanistan, instead of going uh, toward a, an unknown uh, destiny when, when you sort of, you know, want to throw everything out and you want to start from, from uh, scratch. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, Mike. I, um, I, you know, I want to make sure we have time for the last speaker in the debate. So let me stop there. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna let you stop yet. I'm gonna. You're gonna give me one more, uh, an answer to one more question because Ambassador Mukhopadhyaya gave us a very kind of clear picture of the strategic map uh, with um, with Russia. I'm sorry, uh, China and Pakistan uh, 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 dominant. Uh, India, the United States losing out. I think I could be wrong. He may have mentioned uh, uh, China, Pakistan, Iran in, in in the constellation of winners. If you're sitting in Tehran, and uh, let's just assume that uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay's uh, picture is the correct one. If you're sitting in Tehran and looking at that picture, what do you say? What, where are your? Where, where is the um, the dominant feeling among the Iranian elite? Are they looking to re? Uh, um, reestablish the kind of cooperation with India they had back in the 1990s, or do they see themselves on the side of the Russians and the, and, and, and the Pakistanis? Because I, when I, I'm listening to your words, and it seems like Iran is kind of a wild card here if we, if we accept um, the ambassador's presentation. So very short, very quickly, what's your answer to that? Uh, very quickly, I would say, you know, even the hardliners who do want to go in the direction of China and closer ties with China appreciate that too much, uh, too many eggs in the basket of the Chinese in the long term might be un un untenable, that you want to balance it. I mean, in the case of India, you know, not just India, Iran and the United States. I mean, somebody mentioned the port of Chabahar, which is clearly the strategic port here. Uh, the fact that the United States, for example, gave waivers 
to uh, India so they could continue investing in that port, and the Iranians were happy about it, uh, shows you that India, Iran, and the United States all have at times this understanding that, look, uh, you know, if China comes in and eats everyone's lunch, that's not to the benefit of everyone. So uh, I, I would say to you, uh, and this depends on perhaps the nu uh, nuclear talks going on in Vienna at the moment and so forth, so much depends on the U.S.-Iran relationship, Mike. If you have a little bit more confidence on the part of the Iranians and they're able to have enough space to think longer term about their own national security interests, China is a reality. China is Iran's biggest trading partner. It's not going to go anywhere. But that doesn't mean you ignore India. That doesn't mean you ignore others. And I think there are folks in Tehran in terms of the leadership that you pointed to who get that. The question is how to admit it. And I think they just need a, bit, a little bit more political confidence in terms of uh, themselves in their in their survival should the United States not go after them because remember so much of their leadership's calculations are about their own survival at home. Um, but I, I, I would say uh, I would say uh, Russia and India have never been taken out of equation as far as Iran's long-term strategic economic plans have gone. The Chabahar port up to Bandera and Zali, up to Baku, up to Europe that way has been alive the last few years. Uh, so, um, you know, yeah, let me, let me stop there, Mike. Okay, well, that's very, very interesting. And uh, now, last but not least, we're going to move to uh, is uh, Iskander Akulbayev. He's the executive director of the Kazakhstan Council on International Relations and an Atlantic Council uh, Millennium Fellow. Um, if I'm not mistaken, he was a Rumsfeld Fellow in, in, in the past. Uh, and uh, Mr. Akulbayev, it is your responsibility to speak uh, not just for Kazakhstan, but for, for all of the Central Asian countries to explain the, um, in, in a very short period of time the pers their perspective on these, uh, on these developments. Uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of the esteemed circles of uh, experts and government officials, former diplomats. Uh, thank you for the kind perform for, for this opportunity. Speaking about Central Asia, uh, it became a part of the U.S. interest only because of the Afghanistan, mainly, and certainly energy resources. But with the uh, U.S. presence on Afghan soil in, starting in the uh, beginning of uh, uh, 2000, certainly the security factor and the security element in Central Asia has grown. And uh, for countries such as Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Turkmenistan, and Kyrgyzstan, uh, we actually became more aware about what's happening uh, quite near to us. And for a long time, the Afghan factor was associated with the security, instability, and the threat. Well, me personally traveling to Afghanistan, seeing uh, in different cities and provinces what's happening there, seeing the news and uh, different uh, uh, levels of society, and certainly there is a uh, growing this, uh, agreement on what government is doing. And at the same time, the sort of tal Taliban is uh, making everybody uh, quite, in, um, quite irritated and endangered. But speaking on the macro level, uh, if you look at the, the uh, US strategy towards Central Asia, the latest one, which was published last year, uh, out of six main points and bullet points in this US strategy towards Central Asia, two and three, two or three points are, are belong still to Afghanistan, as uh, we are Central Asian states are being a, 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 a connective bridge towards uh, Afghanistan and certainly South Asia. So in this respect, US presence and US interest towards Central Asia lies on the line through Afghanistan. So it's totally understandable. So in this respect, the US withdrawal from Afghanistan with a new uh, administration in the White House certainly raises the question why uh, President Biden accelerates the process of withdrawal and why now? So it's a big question for a debate and it's certainly a big signal for external, regional and uh, geopolitical heavyweights like Russia and China. So in this respect, uh, Moscow and Beijing, uh, their opinion and their influence over Central Asia is also important. There is a question actually in the chat that whether it's possible to uh, do uh, some kind of build a logistics centers uh, from outside of Afghanistan. Certainly being part of this Eurasian landmass and having relationship with Russia and China certainly can pose uh, different issues and questions and its concerns. And we are part promoting this kind of multi-vector foreign policy, balancing among uh, big geopolitical heavyweights. So it's uh, also a sensitive issue in this respect. 
Speaking about economic aspect, uh, not only security level uh, of US withdrawal from Afghanistan, we also take, need to take into account that uh, for almost uh, tw 20 years, US and other donors put more than $140 billion to Afghanistan for reconstruction as a reconstruction aid. World Bank put, uh, gave $6 billion as a, in a soft loans. Uh, there is a, a, a special fund, a reconstruction fund in Afghanistan that actually got certain billion dollars over the last 20 years. So it's a big sum of money that Afghanistan was able to sustain itself, its military its security. So certainly this uh, created a concern inside Afghanistan, how we are able to uh, sustain our uh, uh, national security service, uh, military in this respect. And, but I believe that uh, we, uh, as a Central Asia, we also need to take into account that Afghanistan is a big economic partner, specifically for Kazakhstan. In 2019, the uh, trade turnover between Kazakhstan and Afghanistan was $405 million. It's not a big deal, but for, for Kazakhstan, who's exporting its petroleum, uh, its agricultural product, it's a big deal. So uh, this is a very uh, important market at the same time, but it's, it's necessary to see the potential. So with the pandemic, which is happening now, it hurts Afghanistan, it hurts Central Asia, and uh, the withdrawal, uh, military withdrawal of U U uh, US forces and NATO forces from Afghanistan certainly creates some kind of concern for regional powers and Central Asian states. So the C5 plus one platform, which was launched in 2015 under the Obama administration, and the latest initiative uh, uh, by, uh, under the uh, President Trump, former President Trump and current withdrawal certainly uh, creates some uh, questions among the elites and among the public at some point. So the latest visit by special envoy or US special envoy to Afghanistan, uh, to Kazakhstan uh, by uh, Khalil, Mr. Khalilzad, uh, I, I believe there was a sideline negotiation of how we uh, U.S. is seeing the re regional developments and how what what role Central Asia should play in this uh, greater picture. So it's a, a big question: how for how long U.S. is going to sustain Afghan uh, military service or being as an advisor, or to what level uh, U.S. Uh, financial support is going to continue? Uh, but at the same time, we also need to take into account other voices like women voices like use, so it's a big market uh, in this respect. And despite we're talking about more about kind of connectivity in traditional sense, like logistics or roads, but also we need to talk about the content, what we're going to transfer and transit there. Uh, we need to take into account the digital aspect because in Afghanistan, digital sphere is developing very fast. It's much more than in Kazakhstan or other Central Asian republics like Facebook, uh, Instagram are being used widely by politicians, uh, different factions, etc. So I think it's a great opportunity to use that digital level, digital aspect dimension by building connections between Central Asia and Afghanistan uh, on the cultural, economic and political levels. So mainly, uh, this is my kind of input to the addition to the general overall discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Before I before I let you go, though, can I can I get uh, a little um, bit of a reaction uh, to this debate that this merging debate we're having here about whether you believe the um, the connectivity and the economic interests and the pragmatism of the uh, new Afghanistan, possibly even the pragmatism of the new Taliban, we heard, um, is going to win out. Uh, um, uh, is going to win out over the forces of uh, um, um, over the the tendency of all of the actors to read this purely in a, a zero sum uh, geopolitical hard security um, contest. Uh, thank you, Michael. I think old habits die hard, and uh, it's very difficult to say that the geopolitical zero sum game will fade away immediately, but. Uh, at the same time, we need to build up a second tract where we can actually uh, find out the common ground for political compromise. Whether this political compromise has limits, uh, it uh, certainly has, but I mean, to what extent? And I believe if you look at the, the recent and latest uh, political dimension inside uh, government of Afghanistan, uh, certainly there should be <laughs> more cooperation 
uh, in this respect. So if you look at the parliamentary elections, disagreements between the top level uh, officials, it, uh, it, it doesn't help the Afghan peace process in, in general sense. So I believe that the main issue inside Afghanistan is uh, its internal political, uh, it has political roots rather than kind of military as a main agenda. Is it is it possible that you could have uh, that you could have um, the two simultaneously? So, for example, you could have a trans-Afghan railroad in in the north that would benefit the Central Asian countries, also benefit Pakistan and everybody to the um, everybody to the east. I'm uh, I'm sorry to the, everybody to the west. Um, while you still have a lot of uh, a lot a lot of turmoil, like is there is there space here for um, for ad hoc arrangements of economic and political pragmatism in the midst of geostrategic uh, uh, a geostrategic contest or 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 Ideally, ideally, yes, it's possible. Why not? I mean, if uh, different bodies and different factions see the economic and financial interest, yes. But we are not living in the ideal world. And if you look at the even the the China Pakistan uh, transit roads and the corridor, uh, there was some kind of even disagreements inside Pakistan through which area that corridor should pass. And different cities and different factions didn't agree on that terms. So we are speaking about different countries, and inside those countries there are different political factions, they have strong ground. So ideally, yes, we would like to see that in this way, but uh, let's be like realist and let's start from something smaller and bring even our cultures and the perceptions together. Because in Central Asia, frankly speaking, uh, if you ask the, the common public and ordinary citizens, they not, do not know much about themselves. I mean, about our culture. Even if you look at the Central Asian states, we do not know, um, about the everyday life or like singers, actors, uh, the, the writers of, diff of Central Asian states. So we need to start from the grassroots of building a kind of a trust or at least understanding that we are living in the, we have the common destiny and the shared future in this region. We will not go away and we will not be blocked. So it's up to uh, governments that from the bottom to the top dialogue. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let's go back uh, to to Dr. The, to Dr. Sharifi now. After you've heard all of the uh, presentations of your uh, of your colleagues, Dr. Sharifi, um, have you uh, ha has your has your view shifted in any way? Or let's just say, where do you come down on this question of uh, um, of geopolitical struggle versus um, uh, versus economic pragmatism? And how do you view uh, do you view the contest in the terms that uh, that Ambassador Mukhopadhyaya presented? Well, um, as an anthropologist, I'm always more interested in what's happening actually in the local level and how things like interact and how in a way small things can get together in order to somehow define the big picture. And um, Afghanistan to me somehow presents and based my experience of living here all my life is something a country of very unexpected things uh, and events. Uh, but what's actually some things that we certain think, but certain things are very constant here. When I talked, when I've heard about all this geopolitics and geoeconomics and stuff, the first question came into my mind, and especially when Mr. Segal talked about it, about this sort of a economic cooperation as a means of creating a stability in Afghanistan. And I can look back at the 20 years and I say, well, we had the opportunity quite many often, but the fact it didn't take place. We saw the Taliban emerge as a threat. We saw that the war continued in Afghanistan. So this is sort of like a little bit, that's it actually really the case. When we talk about that, when we focus exclusively on the economic thing, kind of factors to bring stability in the region or in specifically in Afghanistan, that never happened. And actually, there were, I have to say, in many, many instances in the last 20 years, we had absolutely great opportunities for that to take place include from this um, Topi corridors and like Casa 1000 and everything. But in fact, the war continues. So that raises the question is actually, isn't it? In fact, despite being clothed in um, kind of economic things as maybe it's actually it still, can, it still kind of continues to be a zero sum game. And actually some old sort of um, uh, metaphors are used about like ethnic politics in Afghanistan and then how this ethnic groups works and therefore that everything is somehow being 
like become more confusing in a sense for the international community who may not be very familiar intimately with the relations with the sort of like this nuances of Afghan society. Well, what can kind of add to that to kind of like add like shed a little bit of a light, Afghanistan is literally the only mul as a multi ethnic country, as a multi sectarian country, as a multi religious country, it's literally the only country from China to Balkans that never had a secessionist movement. So focusing like literally the only kind of, despite the war, despite the, in the 1990s especially, we don't have, we didn't have a state, we didn't have an NYPD or anything else. But I've honestly somehow all these groups who fought with each other, the Taliban, the Northern Alliance, all these groups, none of them ever actually want to see it, while every single one of them have their characteristics on the other side of the border. And at the same time, when I come about, but, but at the same time, I see the merits in some sort of a, and kind of kind of thinking of honest are not just simply as a zero sum game, but also kind of a part of a larger prosperity of the region from an economic perspective. Yes, Afghanistan has a major potential for being the connection, kind of bring prosperity to Pakistan and actually be a bridge with Central Asia because Afghanistan now it has an infrastructure, thanks to international community, especially the United States. For the first time, maybe after like after since the war began in 20 cent, like since the entire 20th century, I see we have now an infrastructure, actually a railroad that works for that. And that kind of actually is a, 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 a great opportunity to actually think and invest in that and not go just simply think about from just rivalries and, and zero sum game. But, and also, have one, and, but if you can think about it on the other side of the coin, which is from a security perspective, Afghanistan is the only country in the region that actually have every single ethnic group that from Central Asians. You have Kazakhs, millions of Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Tajiks, Turkmen, Kyrgyz, now the Pashtuns and all these things that kind of kind of connect with the Central and South Asia, which means that any kind of if Afghanistan somehow be still defined through a very zero sum game, that means that the entire security of the region will be at stake in that, and that means that we actually have a continuous war. And even despite the sense of triumphalism that actually Mr. Segal very openly showed, one thing we know in, in Afghanistan so that the Taliban will never be able to control anything in the height of the Afghan isolation in the 1990s, in the height that nobody cared and the Taliban were burning and killing and destroying anything. They were not able to control all the country. They, they say 10%, 20%, 5%, 9%, it doesn't matter. There is no plan to control anything because there's no plan to gather. Now saying, now at the end of the day, when we think from a regional perspective, so what we have to do, it actually depends a lot on the level of engagement of the region, including Pakistan and specifically India here, and more importantly, the United States and the Central Asian states. What will be the level of the engagement? We have a choice in which that all parties that are actually think about stabilizing Afghanistan kind of remained in a more meaningful engagement to actually put an end to this war because there won't be any, any victorious, uh, there won't be anything we can't get away. And, or just they're going to continue to fight. And, you know, Afghans are very good in fighting and, mm. uh, and, 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 and they're not, they're not going to be any sort of a victory and stuff. And the chaos will continue to haunt the region and we have probably more chaos and stuff. So it's actually in a sense that, is it the time to be like, as Mr. Segal pointed out and Mr. Ambassador Makupadi actually mentioned that, how we have to think about it, not in terms of totally zero sum game and actually think about where to create a balance. And that balance can only be achieved through a meaningful engagement, diplomatic, kind of economic and political engagement of the world. Because none of this region, neither Pakistan nor Iran nor Central Asian states have the means to actually unilaterally sort of ensure that stability will be possible in Afghanistan. And remember, we had an instability for about like five, six, seven years until the Pakistan re and the Taliban will re kind of emerge from Pakistan. And that was that time that actually the region and the world and somehow agreed to do that. But at the end of the day, to be very practical and as a person who actually been very closely involved with everything that happened to my country in the last 20 years, the main question is like, are the ideological forces in the region specifically in Pakistan will triumph or the more economic sort of rational thinkers that look the region not just as you know, some gain and space for competition with India and actually come and just put like in kind of come up with a settlement through the peace process going on with Taliban with a direct intervention of and, and kind of involvement of international community to come up with an agreement and that is the reality maybe the war and the uh, will determine but we'll see so let me let me put that's a great question to put uh, uh, to Mr. Segal uh, and let me put it to you um, in this form, if I may. Uh, you 
uh, made a very interesting comment uh, earlier um, about uh, the deeper roots of some of these interconnectivities that we're noticing today. Uh, Mr. Segal, you mentioned the, the you mentioned the Baghdad Pact and the connections between Turkey and Pakistan back in the night in the 1950s. Um, I, I know recently these very interesting news stories about the Turks taking over uh, security in the Kabul airport. Uh, I read a report yesterday which said that the Hungarians are now going to join uh, with the Turks in this. Um, it's very easy for me to um, imagine. Um, that uh, while uh, the Turks are filling the vacuum uh, of the uh, Amer that the Americans are leaving behind, and while they are a NATO power, um, I could see a possibility for this uh, Turkish presence to really be welcomed by Pakistan uh, and to be building on these older connectivities that many of us have, uh, have forgotten. Um, and that creates the possibility of some kind of accommodation along the lines of which uh, Dr. Sharifi was, um, uh, was uh, speaking ho um, hopefully for. Uh, so uh, wh what's your view on this? Well, thank you, Michael. Um, you will permit me because uh, I did not get a chance for your follow-up question. But uh, since I did not take uh, the name of India at any time in my presentation, and I was subjected to, uh, you know, a lot of pot shots by Ambassador Gautam. So I'll take two minutes just to say, I can see his frustrations. The peace talks were only possible once India was kept out of it. it was, India was absolutely kept out of it. And that was only possible when uh, that, uh, you know, the peace talk went and Khalil Zab, who was a no friend of Pakistan previously, you know, went ahead and did these talks. And I can see his frustration because basically, uh, you know, all they, they're using, you know, uh, they had a ter terrific proxy war at somebody else's expense and, uh, and uh, they had this thing, et cetera. But I don't want to get into the India Pakistan slinging match, but I will answer your question in a better way. Look, uh, Pakistan has a very good relationship with Turkey, an excellent relationship, right? And to the extent that during the time that the entire uh, Pakistan, the ban on Pakistan, the F-16 spare parts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all of them were coming to us through Turkey. Yeah, even our aircraft were being uh, refurbished there. Weapons were coming. From there, et We've had uh, our relationship with Iran has been based on our relationship with Saudi Arabia and these things, and is the Shia Sunni thing, which we have balanced pretty well. A lot of people do not know the 28% of our population is Shia, right? And in, in almost 28% of our armed forces is Shia, right? And this is possibly the only Islamic country in the world where there's such a balance. There is no problem at any time in the armed forces, Shia, Sunni thing, et cetera. And that's why we like to have a good relationship. If it, we, we cannot afford to, uh, you know, uh, uh, drive away uh, countries like UAE or Saudi Arabia because of our, you know, seeming close to Iran. For us, it's the easiest thing to do. Because it's a contiguous thing. We have such a close relationship. Pakistan welcomes Turkey's, uh, uh, this thing about, you know, we have welcomed Turkey uh, to uh, regard it. Because that, uh, immediately they would not have even offered it without uh, taking uh, some sort of thing from, uh, from Pakistan, right? And, and they know that any support they will require will come from Pakistan, you know, for that thing. It's not from any other country in the world. So. Uh, Pakistan, uh, you know, is this thing, and uh, after the first the gut reaction which the Taliban gave, etc., have you seen that there's a lot of muted this thing because there's nothing like it. And I'm very glad that the Hungarians are coming in because this gives an international uh, touch to it also, rather than just the Turkish this thing. Look, let's put it very bluntly. The, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, like Mr. Sharifi has said, Taliban were never in control of Afghanistan during the entire time that they were. There were areas in Uzbekistan or in uh, or other in uh, Uzbek areas, Tajik areas, Hazar areas, but they're not in control. But the major areas they controlled were the Pashtun area, which was the majority of the population, and they will be in control there. You can there will be elements of them, but I think even those elements would like to come. I don't think there will be bloodletting on the scale or anything like that because the Taliban, they would not like to go back 
20 years, right? And we in Pakistan have fenced our border with, uh, with Afghanistan, by the way. Our entire border of ours is fenced now, which is a very porous border, used to be, but it is actually a fence is in place, right? And, uh, you know, you cannot divide the families because they're tribes which have got, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, let us put it very bluntly. Most of Afghanistan's trade comes through Pakistan. Most of it flows through Pakistan. Most of food items from Pakistan, whether it's uh, wheat, whether it's sugar, whether it's uh, other stuff comes. Some of our, our, most of our fruit comes from Afghanistan. Which, by the way, we are a net uh, exporter of fruit also, but even then some of the extra fruit I think. I think if you look at, then go back to China. China has done a lot of investment in mineral exploration in mining, etc., which is Afghanistan's raw material, which Afghanistan needs, right? right? You know, so there, there is an element where uh, Chinese have got an economic interest in Afghanistan, then they would like that economic interest to it. It's not, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's very well easy to take pot shots and all, but, you know, I, Ambassador Gautam must be very frustrated at what's really happening, and I don't blame them, because they had Afghanistan, they used to use Afghanistan as a favorite, uh, this thing, springboard against Pakistan and the favorite that thing, that's gone, right? And they should forget it because it is the neighboring countries that like every one of the other speakers has spoken out. It is, it is whether it's Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Pakistan, these are the China, which is the country you can think. Today we've got a gas pipeline, uh, which is uh, talk, talked about TAPI, you know, which Dr. Frederick Starr has been working on many, many years on TAPI. We've actually got electricity flowing in from Turkmenistan. Today, electricity is coming through uh, transmission lines through Afghanistan to uh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan is earning uh, transit fees on that electricity, right? Similarly, we need, we, we'll have other uh, uh, gas pipeline. As far as the railways are concerned, there's only a 30 kilometer stretch between uh, the border in Chaman and Kandahar where there's no railway line. Otherwise. The, the railway line goes straight from Gwazar up to Turkundi, up to Turkundi, right? Today, from Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, uh, the cargo trucks are coming through to Gwazar today, uh, as we speak, right? So I think if you look at it from uh, that point of view, and then the Pakistan has given a very heavy price. People do not know that 50,000 civilians have died in, on terrorist attacks. Who was making those terrorist attacks? Right? But where were they coming from? Who were they inspired by? 50,000, right? Over 200,000 injured in those uh, terrorist attacks. We've had 6,000 soldiers killed in, in fighting in those border areas. 6,000, right? We've had 30,000 injured. You know, many of them lost their limbs in this thing. You know, so my point is, it's all very well to, you know, just take a portion of Pakistan, keep India out of the equation, and in ring, they've got an interest. Sure, they can. Uh, they can. They're, they're welcome to trade. They're welcome to do etc. Pakistan has got no problem. But then we understand. We there were mistakes made, as uh, as anybody knows. When I, we accept it, I was the first one to say it. But the point is, this is not the same Pakistan, and that is why. Why did United States choose to keep and Russia, Russia, which is a very good friend of India, why did they choose to keep India out of the talks? There must have been a reason, right? So let us be very clear about it. It is the neighboring countries which have borders with Afghanistan that have got the major interest in a peaceful, stable, prosperous Afghanistan, not the other countries which are far away, which by the way, uh, Iran has 2 million refugees. Mm. We have more than 3 million refugees, right? Why doesn't India take a token 10,000 refugees in India? Token 10,000 refugees in India, right? So. Come on, $3, million, $3 million, uh, billion dollars in aid? Come on, just think about how much $3 million, uh, refugees cost Pakistan on a day-to-day -day basis, and et cetera. And over 20, not 20 years, almost 30 years, we've had these refugees. So the, the point is, you know, we've got to take away going out this uh, blame, et cetera. We've got to concentrate on making sure that we drive the economic side towards the political settlement. And I think the political settlement is there that the, the Taliban, I think, it is my opinion, and given the fact of what I've understood, because I think they understand that. And they understand that, that there is this thing. In Pakistan, there's a realization, no peace in Afghanistan, no peace in Pakistan. 
No peace okay. in Afghanistan, no peace in Pakistan. So we have a vested interest of a peaceful, stable Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Being a very sensitive observer of human beings and international politics, I think I detect a little bit of tension uh, between India and Pakistan here. But uh, I, uh, I want to thank the, the two of you, uh, uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyaya and uh, Mr. Segal, uh, for always presenting that, um, uh, that tension uh, in an intellectual fashion that has given those of us who were not participants in that, uh, in that rivalry um, very clear uh, alternative images of possibilities for Afghanistan. And with that idea, I want to pass, I want to move over to uh, Alex Vitenka. I think he had his hand up. Uh, Alex, it is clearly the job of Iran to balance between India and Pakistan. How are they going to do it? Oh, let, well, I actually I want to say something else. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, uh, the Iran and uh, Pakistan, uh, um, India, well, look, they tried. Remember the peace pipeline? That was the biggest uh, effort undertaken by the three of them over 20 years ago. And where, whatever happened to that peace pipeline? Unfortunately, on the Indian and the Pakistani side, just didn't have the confidence. The Iranians were desperate to get that natural gas over to Pakistan and from there to India, but it just didn't happen. And I believe the Iranian section of the pipeline is ready on the border with uh, uh, sitting, waiting for the Pakistani side to, to build their part of the pipeline. Look, Iran is also, I mean, the Indian-Pakistani rivalries definitely complicate matters, no doubt about it. But the Iranian Islamic Republic, I should say, is totally guilty as well, in the sense that by the way it has carried out its foreign policy, by the way it's uh, created a self-inflicted wound of international isolation, and the sanctions regime that's on it really makes it difficult for countries and certainly companies, international companies, to want to engage with Iran. So this is not just limited to the issue of Pakistan and Iran, Pakistan and India. The Iranian uh, foreign policy has isolated the country. As a result, they have lost that many, many billions of dollars over the last, uh, well, you want to go back to 1979, you can, or certainly recent years. So it's, it's a, it's a part, part of the disease, unfortunately, that is um, impacting broader Iranian foreign policy. But Mike, uh, uh, let, me, let me just say something. I'm certainly not an Afghan specialist. I, I look at Afghanistan from the Iranian perspective, but I just want to make a comment. We heard today how much things have improved over the last 20 years. And certainly in my visits to Afghanistan, I have seen that with my own eyes. Uh, but so much of the improvement seems to have been on the sort of, uh, you know, the infrastructure part uh, and connecting the country and all the rest of it. But I do wonder why <clears throat> they couldn't have moved faster and more deeper among Afghan people. Because when we're talking about Afghanistan as a proxy field for foreign actors, whether regional uh, neighboring states or extraterritorial powers, the elephant in the room is there is vacuum inside of Afghanistan and their local Afghan actors that are looking for foreigners to come and, and help them as benefactors. And unfortunately, over the last 20 years, Afghans, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me they could have made a lot more progress on that front than they have done. So Afghans are still, as a nation, unfortunately for them, so divided. But the good thing, I guess, or the, the reality is they're not the only ones. We've seen that in more recent years in places like Syria. You know, again, uh, so many neighboring states went in and tapped into factions. This is not unique to Afghanistan. There is a fix to this if the Afghans and the international community uh, want to look for a solution that is holistic. Uh, I just want to say, last point, this is something I alluded to earlier, and this is the optimist in me coming out. I sense that the Middle East, the, the billions of dollars that have come out from Middle Eastern states over the least few last decades, that have fueled conflicts from Yemen to Afghanistan to Syria to Lebanon elsewhere. I have this hope that there's a reassessment happening uh, uh, on behalf of key states that have fueled some of these conflicts as part of the geopolitical zero-sum game competition. And these, this reassessment is something we need to once recognize what it is. Hopefully it's real. Hopefully it's going to stay. Um, if they can find a solution to the conflict in Yemen, potentially to say Iran and Saudi Arabia can talk about Yemen, why can't you have a conversation along those lines involving other actors, granted, but about Afghanistan? So I think there's an opportunity here with the region, seriously broader region. And I know Afghanistan is not in the core Middle East, 
but it's been impacted by the politics of the Middle East, Middle East uh, directly. Let's recognize that there's a trend that says dialogue is the way forward. Zero sum game is just going to burn all of us, build on it as much as is possible and hope that a country like Afghanistan that needs a break will also benefit from that sometime soon. Uh, that's my, uh, what I wanted to say, Mike. Alex, um, you know, I, when, I, when I think, um, or when, I, when I listen to that argument of yours, I find myself looking for uh, the key actor that could galvanize um, a, a consensus in that direction. And there are only, it seems to me, uh, I'm, 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 I'm presenting this as a statement, but it's really a question. There are, um, there are only two possible actors, I think, the United States and China. Am I wrong? Is there another? Is there another actor that could uh, that could act as the catalyst or the convener uh, that has relations with all the key actors and could arrive at a at a loose consensus in favor of uh, pursuit of pragmatic economic interest over the over the security questions? Mike, my, my reaction, my response to that is, you're right. Both of them could do it, but there's one big difference. The United States can do it now whereas China would have to wait. And Chinese uh, policy for the Middle East will take probably many years to develop. The Chinese are major, the biggest trading partner of all the states in the Middle East today, but they don't have a hard physical presence to be able to you know, uh, defend some of the policies that they want, might wanna go with. Actually, the United States continues to this day to be the defender of, of if you will, uh, the status quo. So China could play that role, but it can't do it today. So if you want to get things done today, it's the United States, obviously, with support of, of allied states and hopefully the list of countries that want to you know, go along with the United States. That list will grow for the benefit of the region. It's almost far-fetched to add Iran to it. But let's not forget Iran, the country that, were, that I was speaking to uh, the, today's panel. You know, 20 years ago, they were briefly uh, with the side of the United States against the Taliban, right, when, 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 uh, when things were working out. It goes back to the point I made earlier. If the Iranian uh, Islamic Republic of Iran wants to go in a different direction in the sense of its foreign policy priorities, um, I think there are things that even Iran can do with the United States for the benefit of a country like Afghanistan. Uh, it's just, um, it's a question of priorities. And, and I'm, I'm not sure where Tehran is gonna go, but to your point about China, yes, China is a reality of life, but I just don't see the Chinese having the confidence, having had the vision to, to sort of, formulate a, that kind of a vision for the Middle East will they come in and they replace a, an entity like the United States with all the experience it's had now for the last 20 years in Afghanistan and the broader uh, Middle East. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Uh, you know, we're already an hour, an hour and a half. I think we should think now of wrapping up, but I, I wanna give um, uh, Mr. Uh, um, Akhlebaev and uh, Ambassador Mukhopadaya uh, the opportunity to, um, uh, to respond to some of the things that have been said. Uh, gentlemen, let's go in that order. Um, uh, Mr. Akhabayev, I wonder if I could also just throw one other little thing on your, it's not a little thing, it's a huge thing, but you'll have to address it because of time very quickly. Um, I was recently in uh, Uzbekistan and I heard from a number of people, uh, uh, not officials, I'm talking about people on the street, um, uh, express the fear that American, the American pullout was going to, could very well result in an increase of um, radical Islamic, um, uh, uh, the power of radical Islamic movements in Uzbekistan. Uh, and I wonder if there, if that feeling is, uh, if that, I, I, I was not in a position to understand how widespread that feeling was, but it was something I heard um, uh, many more times than just once. Uh, is that something? Is that a is that a fear that's shared throughout the uh, throughout the region? And uh, what kind of what kind of measures, just in general, um, should we be thinking about to prevent it if it is? Well, certainly extremism and terrorism were part of the the security agenda for Central Asia for a long time. And uh, interestingly enough, it was the only common ground before for a long time that united Central Asian states despite the, some disagreements on the uh, top level. So it's still a uh, kind of a, a certain issue that uh, bothers people around the region. And if you look at the Syrian crisis, say what happened in the Middle East, there was some Central Asian foreign fighters traveling to the Middle East through different countries, through different roads. 
uh, and certainly that created questions in Central Asia, whether, uh, for example, returning those uh, foreign fighters, their families to the region, how we are going to rehabilitate them. And certainly the US withdrawal is a kind of logical continuation, whether we'll have a new wave of extremism in, in, in Central Asia. But I believe yeah. that in Uzbekistan, in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, uh, uh, specifically in these those two states, um, they have we have uh, strong measures uh, combating terrorism, and uh, in other cases we are able to kind of help and assist, uh, provide a humanitarian uh, support to the people who suffered from different uh, ex ex uh, extremist ideology in this respect. But I believe uh, uh, it's only possible to combat this kind of threat by collective measures inside Central Asia. If we're able to uh, create some kind of uh, common vision and co uh, common threat index in Central Asia, how are we going to respond to that? What is our reaction to uh, as a collective mechanism, as a collective body inside Central Asia? Are we able to do that? If we're able to promote and provide clear and transparent answers to the public, certainly this discussion will be in less degree than now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you get the final word. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first say that it's been a very, very interesting discussion, and I'd like to thank uh, all of my fellow panelists. So let me just, you know, react to a, a few points that have been coming up over the course of the discussion. One is, I think, your point, you know, somehow juxtaposing uh, geoeconomics and pragmatism as opposed to geopolitics. Let me say that geoeconomics is geopolitics uh, through economics. Uh, and uh, if, uh, um, you know, a, a certain country was serious about geoeconomics, uh, I find it ironic that uh, uh, Pakistan sometimes talks about uh, uh, Afghanistan benefiting from the transit trade. All that it needs to do is open up two-way transit trade between Afghanistan and India. Uh, but we all know that this is kept one way, uh, that the Afghanistan-Pakistan transit trade agreement has never been opened up to uh, include trade with India. And in fact, Pakistan would be the biggest beneficiary in terms of the transit benefits that would uh, come out of that. The second is, you know, this business about talks. Uh, I think we have to, uh, people need to uh, understand this. India has, the, the intra-Afghan talks began at Doha and India joined that talks, it was invited and joined that talks right, right, right from the beginning. And in fact, blessed those talks. And for India, the best case scenario, the best solution possible is a power sharing agreement in which the Taliban and uh, the Republican side uh, uh, compromise and are able to form a united government. There is no second uh, uh, view on this. Uh, that would be the best case scenario. This is our uh, preferred solution. Uh, uh, that unfortunately doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, and India's dealings, you know, with uh, let's say the U US Taliban deal with Moscow talks and so on. India, by the way, was part of the Moscow talks. Uh, the fact is that in those countries, countries were cutting deals with the Taliban behind the back of the Afghan government. India was not part of any of those arrangements because India did not want to cut a deal uh, behind the backs of the Afghan people, the Afghan Republic and the Afghan government. And India joined those talks when it was in invited only when intra-Afghan talks uh, began. Uh, and, you know, very often there's a tendency to make an equivalence between India and Pakistan on these issues. The fact is that India's record in Afghanistan and Pakistan's record are completely different. Just because Pakistan insists of bringing, linking itself with India, attaching itself to India, and uh, uh, equating its India with somehow with itself, it's not, it does not make it true. I think the Afghan people know the reality, and I think let's leave that, leave, leave it at that. Uh, China's investments, in fact, China has not really invested in Afghanistan. It has put its property uh, uh, marker on some properties like Messinak. Uh, the copper mines, but it has not really invested anything. And in fact, I think China uh, needs to be a bit wary about its association with Pakistan and Afghanistan because there is a strong anti-Pakistan anti feeling. And also, uh, I'm not so sure, you know, on the whole, it may be a good thing for China to invest in, uh, in Afghanistan. I just as I think it would be a very good thing for India to invest in Afghanistan. But China also should be careful that, you know, perhaps there are some great games going on there. Uh, just as the Soviet Union was lured into a bear trap, uh, in the next generation, it could be China that is lured into uh, a bear trap. I didn't have the time to go into nuances uh, in relations with uh, uh, Iran, uh, uh, Russia, and so on. 
But let me just say that I think we have a great commonality of interest with uh, Iran. Uh, this commonality of interest will come out. Iran is no pushover. It has its own independent policy, however misguided they may be. And to your question, US or China, which country can play a bridging role? I feel that if there is one country in the region that can pick up the reins, if it can lift its foreign policy game, uh, it is Iran. Iran has good relations with just about everybody else except the United States. And if the United States is, is withdrawing, uh, this is one country that could uh, play such a bridging role. Thank you. That's all. Well, uh, that's a very interesting idea. You know, it's a, it is a shame when you look at the Islamic Republic uh, to see the way it has uh, decided to um, conduct its foreign policy through the Revolutionary Guards. Um, the when I in my recent trip to Uzbekistan, I kept hearing longing from Uzbeks. Uh, that the uh, that the Iranian regime uh, would adopt a different attitude uh, toward the world because it is in that part of the world a kind of natural uh, you know a kind of natural um, um, center of gravity. Um, it's a shame that it won't play that role. Maybe we can look forward to that in the future. If this uh, growing connectivity of Central Asia uh, continues, uh, if everything doesn't roll backwards and uh, and Iran joins the family of nations, maybe we can look to something uh, uh, more positive. I'll end on that positive note. I want to thank all of you. Uh, this was extremely interesting. I have um, many, many more questions, and that, I think it's just a sign of uh, how successful this has been. So uh, without, uh, without further ado, I'll say um, uh, farewell, and I hope to see you again um, in, in this forum. Thank you.